All right, thanks everybody for attending virtual Best Bark Club meeting number two. We're gonna have a good presentation tonight, I think, um, um, from, um, um, geez, Andy Siebold and uh, I guess Bill, I'm gonna let Bill introduce Andy. He's always comes up with something very flowery and, and elegant. Uh, but let's go ahead and, and get started and we'll uh, do the uh, pledge in just a second here. Uh, okay. How do you like that? <laughs> All right, you guys ready? <laughs> oh, we have to turn here. around here. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Of the, uh, of the United States, States of, America. of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, liberty and justice for all. How do you like that? Awesome. Well, that's why we can't play music. Uh, <laughs> Okay, let's see. No, but you should be George C. Scott at the beginning of Patton. That's exactly what I was thinking. I was look, if I'd have had a helmet and a, and a you know one of those coats. Okay, that's better than the bathroom. Okay, let's see. Let's go around the block here and everybody introduce themselves and say who they are. I'm Brian, K6 BPM. No, you should be George C. Scott. Anybody, let's start with you. That's exactly what I was thinking. I was looking. If I'd have had a helmet and a, and a you know, one of those. Who's got? Okay, um, I'll start. Um, but if you have this audio playing in the background, if you could turn it off. Um, that would probably make things a lot easier. Otherwise, we're just going to have a giant feedback loop. So, um, yeah, just it, turn your, if you're streaming it on YouTube, either bring the volume down on the YouTube web page or uh, just turn, uh, just close that window while, uh, while we're doing this round robin of names. So, I'm Levi K6LCM and I'm going to unmute everybody. So, I'm um, just, uh, try to stay quiet in your area till it's your turn. I know we've got a lot of people here, so it's gonna be a little awkward, but we'll see what we can do. So um, I guess I'll turn it over to uh, Lee. Les? I'm sorry, Les. W6CGE. Uh, David? Hi, okay, I'm Dave K6 VML in San Bernardino. And Eric? Me, yeah. KG6, WXC, Eric, down here in uh, Port Wainimi, Oxnard. Doc? Whiskey 6, Echo Whiskey in Santa Barbara. We've got Les, Larry. Yeah, uh, Larry, WA6MVJ, uh, the voice of No Lita. <laughs> Dorothy? And Kilo 6, Delta Sierra Oscar, in also No Lita, at five points. Mike, down in Oxnard. Mike, W0JFB in Monterey Pines, Santa Barbara. Okay, and uh, Mike, CBB. Mike, your turn, Mike. I think he went, he was very quiet. I think his connection is slow. Okay, Bill. Yeah, Bill W1UUQ from Galita North. Bruce. Still a Foxtrot 6. Romeo Alpha India out there in the beautiful outdoors right now. <laughs> Are you trying? And uh, CBH. That would be Colin. KM6OLA, I'm in Hope Ranch. Hi, Colin. Al, KMZ. Uh, this is Al, KD9KMZ in uh, West Downtown Santa Barbara. Brian? 
Hi, I'm Ryan, KM6JWL, and I'm in Goleta at Patterson and Hollister. And those guitars are real, not a background, right? Yes, they are very real. <laughs> we got Mike, JFB, Wayne. Yeah, Alpha Fox, Trot 6, Golf X-Ray, Santa Barbara. Uh, AI6VX. AI6VX, Dave and Ventura. Uh, Glenn, HJW. This is Glenn, Kilo November 6, Hotel Juliet Whiskey in Hilton. Callie is here. Oh, yes, I am. Uh, hi there, Levi. You know, I think your mic might be a little hot. I, 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 okay, I think Callie's got some things going on there. Uh, let's see, hold on. Okay, uh, Jim. Jim Henry. Sorry, my mic, mic was muted. Jim Henry, AJ, 6 a.m. Haven't seen you guys in years. Hope all is well, and uh, it's a great opportunity to stay in touch. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, Daryl looks like he's connecting to audio, so we'll go up to Ken. Uh, this Ken? Yeah. <laughs> Just going around introducing ourselves, Ken. Okay, uh, Ken Alger, K-A-6-K-E-N, in Goleta. I guess Bill and I are the two reps tonight. Great. And Daryl? Looks like Daryl is not there yet, so I'll turn it back over to Brian. Okay, if, uh, if you're listening to the YouTube stream in the background, you need to turn it down because we can hear it here and it's delayed and it's, uh, it's a little distracting. Um, did, did you get uh, Mike W0JFB? I did, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. I did my... introduce Andy because I figured Bill would. Yeah, Bill's going to introduce Andy. We didn't forget you, Andy. He's, he's got the nicest looking shack up there anyway. I thought pretty. he was in a fire station. Yeah, he looks <laughs> a real official. The, uh, uh, well, we don't, uh, there isn't a whole lot new going on, obviously. We're trying to keep things under control and, and uh, keep the meetings and nets going on. And uh, we're doing our board meetings and our um, uh, club meetings. Hopefully, this will be. Uh, so far, it seems to be going pretty good. Got some complaints about no flag for the Pledge of Allegiance, so we fixed that. So, and I saw Bill over there smiling and saluting, so I, I hope he approved. The, uh, <laughs> it took me about 20 minutes to find the appropriate image for the, for the flag. The, uh, anyway, so I'm going to turn it over to Bill to introduce Andy. And um, I've been looking forward to this. I've only, I think I've only seen one other thing that Andy's uh, um, done or presentation or something. And, and that's it. So it's uh, something I think everybody's going to enjoy. So uh, W1UUQ, would you like to introduce Mr. Seabold, please? Okay. Uh, W1UUQ here. I'll get started here with. Uh, if you haven't seen this hat, you better begin to recognize the symbol. Uh, you'll be seeing a lot more of it. This is the first net hat. And on the back side here, it says first net built with AT&T. You're going to hear all about that tonight. And um, I'd like to introduce Andrew Siebold, who was a former resident here in Santa Barbara. And for those of you uh, uh, who have not met Andy in person, uh, you'll find he's a very remarkable person indeed in the communications field. I'm not going to, I didn't, uh, I don't have anything prepared, but I would like to read from his website, which talks about his background. Of course, I can't uh, remember everything here that's on this page, but I, I can read it. In any case, uh, let me get started. And I did want to say that uh, for the benefit uh, of uh, people that uh, cannot see uh, OBB and CPN, 
so forth, there may be others out there. Uh, I know there's a response from them. So uh, when you're on there, uh, try to remember that they are listening. So you have to break things down a little bit uh, differently than when you have a uh, cited meeting, so to speak. In any case, I'll read this as follows. Andrew Seabol has been involved in public safety and public safety communications for more than 50 years, starting as a first responder and then working with RCA Mobile Communications, General Electric Communications, Biocom, where he helped develop the first paramedic radio for sending voice and EKG from an incident to a hospital, and also Motorola. In 1981, he began his, he began his career as a consultant, educator, and author. For the past 10 years, Mr. Seabold has been volunteering his time and efforts to the public safety community in its quest to build a nationwide interoperable broadband communications network and has worked closely with the Public Safety Spectrum, public safety spectrum Trust, the Public Safety Alliance, the Major City Chiefs Association, APGO, the International Chiefs of Police, the National Sheriff's Association, and other organizations. Mr. Siebold is a board member and a fellow of RCA. Uh, that's the Radio Club of America, not the company RCA, but Radio Club of America. He received RCA Sarnoff Award, APCO's President's Award, and, spe and Special Partnership Recognition Award, National Public Safety Telecommunications Council Special Recognition Award, National Sh Sheriff's Association President's Award, and the Public Safety Spectrum Trust Commendation. Since 1910, Mr. Siebold has been publishing a weekly blog and news summary known as the Public Safety Advocate. He is recognized for his ability to turn highly technical jargon into prose that helps a broader audience understand what is happening in the world of FirstNet and public safety communications. His background includes consulting, writing, and educational seminars in the commercial cellular industry, as well as the concentration on public safety communications, making him one of the few people conver conversant with all the sides of the wireless industry. And I just want to add to this uh, that um, uh, in meetings to come forward, I'd like to get in a little bit more into Andy's work with the radio club. That's not for tonight, but there's a broad history of what Andy was doing with the radio club that was pretty much benign to a lot of people what was happening in the background. And we owe much of what we got here in Santa Barbara in terms of our, especially our building downtown, which is one of the few in the whole country like, uh, like uh, what the club has there, uh, the communications site there at 7-9. With that, I'll turn it over to Andy. Andy, it's good to see you. And I uh, love your shack as usual, you do everybody up. Well, what can I tell you? This actually isn't my shack, it's my desk. When we moved here four years ago, um, we were very fortunate to find a property that had a, a, a two-car garage in the back plus a separate room, which has become my office and also my electronic shop. Um, but I sure miss Santa Barbara, I'll tell you that. Uh, there's not a day that goes by that I don't miss the people there and the work there and everything else. But let me go on with... Uh, what I'm going to talk about today and see if I can bring it up here on the screen. Um, there we go. So I'm going to talk about public safety communications, the advances, then three flavors of 5G, which a lot of people are talking about, and how it all relates to amateur radio and the fact that amateur radio really has to find a new niche with all of this coming about. Um, so let's start with this. Um, the question is, is there still a need for amateur radio? My answer is yes, and I'll explain that as I go along. I don't want to get into too much of the history, but let me just say that from the time that the Oklahoma bombing happened um, at the Muir uh, government building in Oklahoma until today, it's taken the public safety community 25 years 
to get the new spectrum they needed, to get the relief they needed, and everything else to get this uh, public safety first net broadband network in place. Um, it didn't hurt. I mean, it was terrible that it happened, but after we had the Muir uh, disaster, then we followed that with the 9-11 terrorist attacks, hurricanes Katrina and Sandy. And what this all did was it brought forward something that every one of us have known for years, which is that public safety land mobile radio is spread out uh, low band VHF, UHF, 700, 800, uh, now at 4.9 gigahertz. And very few agencies can talk to other agencies over LMR, even in Santa Barbara, until you get your new systems. Uh, county fire can't talk to county sheriff. Uh, city fire can't talk to city uh, police. And that's what we set out to um, to really take care of. The history here is long and involved. I'm writing a book about this that should be out in the next month or two, I hope. Um, but we started in 2006. You might recognize the name Morgan O'Brien. He was a co-founder of Nextel. And he started the ball rolling in 2006 by talking about the need for a public safety broadband network. It took until 2008 before the FCC authorized some 700 megahertz spectrum for public safety. But even that, there was 24 megahertz authorized. Half of it was 12 and a half kilohertz land mobile radio channels. And the other 12 and a half uh, uh, megahertz was for um, 50 kilohertz channels, which in those days, you wouldn't call it broadband, but it was to allow some data services for public safety. It didn't take long after that happened for public safety to recognize that broadband was really the way to go. And so we turned the 50 kilohertz channels into five megahertz by five megahertz of broadband for LTE technology. And the license was issued to the Public uh, Safety Spectrum Trust. If you hear more about FirstNet and everything else, you're going to hear a lot about Chief Harlan McEwen, who's really the godfather of this whole network. Um, we proved, and I was part of the task force that did this, we went up to Oakland and we ran a set of video streams on the five by five portion that was up in Alameda County and working. And we figured out that five by five megahertz of spectrum was not enough for public safety. After we got to the fourth video, we started sending the fifth one. And not only did the fifth one crash, but all four of the others crashed. So we knew we didn't have enough spectrum. We had to fight. This is an interesting part of this whole story. Um, 2009, 10, and 11, and 12, we had to fight not only Congress, but we had to fight the Federal Communications Commission and T-Mobile and Sprint, who both wanted what is called the D-Block to go to auction. We proved to everybody that we really needed 10 by 10 or 20 megahertz of spectrum in order to make this work. And if you know how cellular systems work, the FCC said that if we use the standard way of figuring out how many users you can fit on a network, that um, public safety doesn't have nearly enough. Excuse me. But what they didn't realize is that an awful lot of the um, activity for public safety is in a very small area where they have to be within a single cell sector or a single cell site so that we had to have more spectrum uh, in order to have the capacity on a local basis. We had all kinds of bills introduced. Senator McCain and Senator Lieberman um, 
representative came from New York, additional bills were also issued, and we tried over and over and over again to get bills through Congress to no avail. Finally, in 2012, um, we got added to a bill called the Middle Class Tax Relief Act of 2012. And Section 6 called for the creation of the Nationwide Public Safety Broadband Network, which was signed into law in 2012 by then President Obama. This was a big deal. It came with a cost, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but the bill was passed 13 years after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Um, we had good news and bad news out of this. The good news was we got our 10 by 10 of 700 megahertz spectrum. We also got $7 billion in funds committed to public safety. That came from a future auction. And that, that $7 billion, anybody who knows cellular and what it costs to build out a network, that's kind of a starting point. Um, this network, when it's finished, will cost 30 to $40 billion. Um, and we got a few million dollars for research and development, and the first net authority was formed. Um, the board members were uh, pre-approved. What we lost was we had to give back the T-band, which is shared TV spectrum in 470 to 512, and it's meant to cease operation in 2022. Now, this spectrum is used in 11 metropolitan areas. Boston, New York, Washington, D.C., Miami, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, not small cities. And right now we're working with Congress uh, and there are bills in the House and the Senate to repeal this give back. When Congress went and took this spectrum back, they assumed that they could put it out to auction and it would worth, be worth billions of dollars. And since then, things have changed dramatically. So it's not worth anything except to the public safety community. So FirstNet was awarded the contract. Uh, it, there were three bidders who bid on it. Two were disqualified. So we had one bidder left, which was AT&T. And the states and the territories had a right to opt out of FirstNet by December 2017. What they could do is they could go out to bid for their own portion of the FirstNet network and have it then integrated into the network. It turns out that nobody, none of the 50 states or six territories opted out. So FirstNet is made up of all 50 states and all six territories. Now, let me just say here, that does not mean that local agencies need to join or required to join FirstNet. It's up to the local agencies to make their own decision. So now we got a surprise. We expected that AT&T would build out band 14, which is the public safety spectrum 20, uh, 10 by 10. AT&T saw it a little differently. What they said was, we're going to build out your band 14. But in the meantime, we are going to offer up all of the LTE spectrum that AT&T has and provide preemption and priority access on all of that spectrum. Now, what that means today is my uh, FirstNet phone has absolute priority on the network so that if there are crowded conditions in a congested area like a stadium or something else, and I need to make a call or send a text, I will get through and the commercial users, their data rates will go down or they will get reassigned to a different portion of the spectrum. That's what public safety needed and that's what we got. Um, so we got all that. Also, AT&T has cows, colts, and UAVs. A cow is a cell on wheels, a colt is a pickup truck on wheels, basically, and then UAVs and drones. They now have a blimp, and they just signed the deal 
with Google's Loon. You may have heard of Loon balloons. Um, so they'll also be using some of the loons. Uh, they used one in Puerto Rico that was fairly effective. So where we are today with FirstNet is that there are 1.3 million FirstNet users representing 12,000 public safety agencies. Now that's not all of the agencies and it's not all of the users. There are potentially five to six million users who will be on the network. Um, there are a hundred specialized apps. There are a hundred first net ready devices. And when I say first net ready devices, that means my iPhone has band 14 built into it. And with a special SIM, uh, what, what AT&T calls a black SIM that says I have access to the first net network. Um, the other interesting things there are the fact that uh, the network today covers 2.61 million plus square miles. And there's some other things there. Um, band 14 is 75% complete. AT&T on the five year build is about a year and a half ahead of schedule. Here's the spectrum for those of you who like to look at spectrum. You can see on the left is the land mobile radio spectrum spread out all over the place. And then if you look on the right, you'll see public safety has two, has, um, two sets of frequencies here. We have land mobile radio and we have the broadband, which is now called FirstNet. Um, so now what's next in all of this? Right now we have FirstNet and land mobile radio. We are working very hard on next generation 911. Next generation 911 makes this all fit together because it's broadband input to the 911 centers or now what they call the emergency communication centers. What that means is that dialing 911 and using voice works, text will work, but more importantly, incoming calls can include, for example, a picture of a hit and run vehicle or a video that somebody wants to shoot. And that will go to the operations center, it will be fully vetted, and then it will be sent to those dispatched um, into the field. Um, so a little more on all of this, but you don't need to really get into this. These slides will be available, by the way. Um, a couple of things that I want to make a point about. Public safety needs are different from commercial broadband users. Public safety needs lots of bandwidth and speed, even for small incidents that may be covered by only one or two cell centers. Public safety needs seamless connectivity between FirstNet and any and all LMR systems. We're in the process of taking push to talk on FirstNet and integrating it with FirstNet, uh, push to talk on the LMR systems. FirstNet is nationwide. And what that means is, and it's just, it's just happened, when AMR sent ambulances from California to New York, when they got to New York, they still could talk to the New York dispatch and they still could be dispatched. And oh, by the way, they could talk to their dispatchers back in California. That's truly what we work for, which is full interoperability. I, I wanna talk a little bit about push to talk here. Um, there's something that's coming online called mission critical push to talk. I happen to really object to the term mission critical because it's not mission critical. It's push to talk developed for the LTE standard on a network which is not a mission critical network. Um, there are, it's going to get better, but right now what we have is kind of a hodgepodge on FirstNet we have four or more approved push to talk vendors on FirstNet, none of which are compatible with each other at this point. There's a big push for FirstNet to LMR push to talk integration, but it's not simple or inexpensive. And there are bridges to cross connect everything. But the biggest problem with LTE today, and something that you 
and all of the hands can fit into is that mission critical push to talk is lacking off network communications. There is no way to have simplex or talk around except for something that the standards body calls pro se. And pro se says that one unit can talk to another without using the network. Now I gotta tell you that you're using a quarter watt phone with an antenna buried inside of it to talk to a quarter watt phone with an antenna buried inside of it. And guess what? You and I can yell further than you can talk using ProSe. So there is a big hole in mission critical push to talk on FirstNet that needs to be solved and it's being solved right now with land mobile radio but there's also i believe an opportunity here for amateur radio to provide that simplex or off network link when it's needed um, there's a critical need today integration will enable an agency handling the incident to coordinate with incoming units if everybody's got the same push to talk and if everybody's on the same frequency and, the, and first net, um, it's better than it has ever been, but there are, there's still a long way to go. Um, we need a common or several common open standard and expensive ways to provide LMR to first net integration. Excuse me. We have agencies using digital P25 systems, which is what you're gonna end up with in Santa Barbara. Uh, we may need a different solution for agencies still using analog FM, which are your fire departments. And I don't see them leaving analog FM anytime soon because California has one of the best fire interoperability systems up and down the coast, except for the major cities because they have 320 channel radios that virtually will talk anywhere in the state. So that's a good system and it works. And if it works, you shouldn't change it. There are organizations working on trying to solve the problem. The 3GPP standards body is the standards body for um, LTE. I'm part of the Public Safety Technology Alliance. I'm also on a committee for the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council and several others to try to get some of this resolved. Um, so let's talk about what needs to be done. It's a great push to talk platform for providing multi-agency interoperability, but we need to have push to talk interoperability, which I think we'll get to. Rural broadband coverage, FirstNet has by Congress's mandate to cover a lot of rural broadband uh, areas that are not covered today. You hear lots of stories about the bridge digital divide. Now, there's one thing, let me add one other thing here. Band 14, which is the public safety 10 by 10 band, is a very special band for cellular because cellular systems are required by law around the world to operate at a quarter watt, 250 milliwatts. However, band 14, which was passed into law as a part 90 or land mobile radio band, you can use 1.25 watts of output power, 10 times the output. So that, and FirstNet is the only network in the United States where that's permitted. So it has a real advantage. Uh, and we're starting to see devices come out now. Uh, I just wrote an article this week about uh, what they call HPUE, high power user equipment that will be available. It will also be available to non-public safety agencies uh, or people, consumers in this way. When the federal government passed Band 14 for FirstNet, they realized that if AT&T or anybody else was gonna build out the network, they had to make some money at it. So they allowed for band 14 on a secondary basis to be used for commercial traffic. And that means that if 
public safety is not using all of the band in a given area, take San, San Bernard, uh, Santa Barbara, then AT&T users with band 14 capability will be switched over there to help defray the, the bandwidth use in, in the area. If public safety all of a sudden needs it, those users will be shifted to a different portion of the spectrum. So it really helps everybody uh, with band 14 and high power. Um, I think, by the way, that we're going to have a standard for interconnecting LMR to FirstNet by the end of this year. Hopefully, I'm not being an optimist. Um, this is all the ways you do it today. You have uh, DFSI, you have radio over IP and new radio IP over IP plus. There's an interoperability standard. If you have P25, you love all these uh, these acronyms because nobody knows what any of them mean. But you also, if for a P25 trunk system, can use a technology called ISSI to intercommunicate between LMR and FirstNet. So that's FirstNet, and that's where we are today. It's up and running. It's available in all 50 states. Um, as I said, uh, agencies do not have to go to FirstNet if they don't want to. There's a lot of agencies still using Verizon. T-Mobile has some agencies, and Sprint does too, although Sprint's going away. But um, more and more agencies are coming over to 5G, uh, over to FirstNet. And I have to tell you that because of the virus, more agencies than ever before are coming over because there's a concern about how much bandwidth there is available. And FirstNet has absolute control over their bandwidth. So uh, even when, if AT&T's network crashed, which it hasn't, um, nobody's network has crashed yet, but if it did, uh, FirstNet would still be up and running. Now, I'm going to shift gears here for a minute and talk about 5G and Internet in the sky. I heard somebody earlier talking about all the little Leos coming overhead, but let's talk about that. 5G is the next big thing. You've all heard about it. There's a lot of people who think it's dangerous. Uh, there's a lot of people who think it's... There, there are some people who think the virus is has been transmitted by 5G, which is absolutely not true. It is the next evolution, but it is very different than anything we've seen before. And people get confused. T-Mobile says we have 5G nationwide. Well, the answer is yes, they have it nationwide. But if you look at this wedding cake, it's the low band nationwide that they have. They're running it on 600 megahertz. And what you have is a little bit faster than LTE, but not a great bit faster. In mid-band, which is 2.5 to 6 gigahertz, it's faster than LTE with lower latency. But where it really makes a difference is in the millimeter wave band of 24 to 99 gigabits, uh, gigahertz, where there are gigabit speeds. But it's important to understand that millimeter wave small cell coverage area is measured in yards and not miles. And what's going to happen, and I don't know what's going on in Santa Barbara, but I can imagine the Planning Commission is having to fit over all this. The FCC passed a rule that right-of-way areas, for, uh, suppliers of 5G have absolute access to without having to really worry about permits. And that's not sitting well with a lot of cities, I can tell you that. Um, let's look at this. Um, 5G originally was to use spectrum of 20 gigahertz or higher. Many small cells located close to the services where needed, data speeds in the gigabit. Um, however, 5G is now used in the three bands I told you about. And by the way, Get ready for 6G, because 6G is coming, and that starts at 100 gigahertz and goes up. And you talk about low range, that's going to be low range. Um, so small cells, lots of bandwidth, lots of capacity per cell, used for point to point or to cover small areas. Um, it's about 
right now replacing cable or DSL with 5G services in the home. And we still have a number of issues to be resolved. One is if the spectrum is bid, which it has been in this country, will the winning um, vendors share their bandwidth with other networks or is this gonna be um, multiple, multiple, multiple small cells each on a different set of frequencies. We don't know the answer to that. And each community will end up with multiple, multiple poles in the right of way, and 5G um, will be ready for prime time. Um, you can buy devices today, but it's really a year, a year and a half away. Here are some small cells, um, and there are newer ones, but there's some really ugly ones, as you can see, and then there's some really nice ones that hardly show at all. Here's a little map of the difference between 4G and 5G. You can see that 4G, there's one power that covers this whole area, and 5G, there are multiple, multiple millimeter wave cells to cover the same area. But difference in speed here, you're talking 30 megabits a second, and over here, you're talking about gigabits of speed. Um, I talked about T-Mobile. Um, it's still fiber, microwave, or satellite backhaul. Um, LTE isn't going away. Uh, LTE is going to be used for distribution to small cities and 5G for denser population. In addition to this, we now have Wi-Fi 6. And I'm going to talk about Wi-Fi 6 for a minute because it's a disaster waiting for a place to happen. I know that a lot of you are very into mesh networks, but Wi-Fi 6 uses the 6 gigahertz band, and it was just authorized by the FCC. Now, the problem with it sharing unlicensed spectrum with licensed microwave is that, for example, county and city and state all use 6 gigahertz for mission critical microwave. And the FCC has ensured us that there will be no interference. And very few people actually believe that. So we're gonna have to see what happens. The other thing they did last month, which I haven't done in the slide, is they've authorized a company called Vigato to put in 5G low power right above the GPS band. And the DOD and the Air Force and the Army are fit to be tied and they've gone to Congress to try to stop that. In 2012, we already fought that battle and won because we proved that a technology in that band that's terrestrial will basically destroy GPS close into each cell site. So that's something else. The FCC has not done well by critical communications. Okay, so let's look at some other things. Um, AT&T has now said that in addition to all their LTE spectrum, public safety is entitled to the 5G spectrum that AT&T owns, and again, with full priority and preemption. Preemption means absolute priority of the spectrum. Um, and AT&T network will share the network with other people in um, non-emergency times. FirstNet has its own core, the network nervous system. And even though FirstNet users share AT&T spectrum, they have a different SIM uh, called a black SIM uh, for their own network. They have their own, if you know what a PLM ID is, that's the network ID. In 2011, we went and got a PLM ID number specifically for public safety. So they operate as a separate independent network on AT&T. Okay, let's go to Little Leos, thousands of them. If everybody launches the Leos they're talking about, there will be 18,000 Little Leos flying around above us. Um, SpaceX plans 12,000. Boeing says they're going to do 1,400 to 3,000. Um, 
one web was going to do has 600 operational. However, they filed for Chapter 11. Um, Amazon wants to put up 3,226. These have all been approved by the FCC. Um, nobody knows how all this is going to work. The cost to put these in the air, the cost to put in ground stations, the cost to put antennas on our houses because they won't work indoors is going to be horrendous. And I, for one, don't believe that all of these companies are going to survive. And the other thing I question is since these little birds are whipping around the universe at a thousand miles an hour, the handoffs are going to be very, very short and are going to have to be very good. Um, I'm not a big believer that this is a technology that's going to stick. I've been wrong before. We'll see what happens. So here's a little bit about uh, what's going on for internet uh, in the sky providers. Uh, how are they going to afford to pay for them? How much are customers going to have to pay? Everybody's saying, well, these are for rural areas, and rural areas tend to have not as much income available. And over on the right, I, I listed all four of these that have failed. Iridium 2 is trying again, but they're not having much success. So, uh, like I said, I'm a doubter here. Um, We'll see what happens. Um, they claim they're going to cover 100% of the world. Me, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, so where does this lead public safety and amateur radio? Public safety has to integrate three networks. Amateur radio has to once again find its niche. niche that's for sure. So let's look. We've got to take 911, which will be an IP backend network. We've got land mobile radio, which has got to be converted to IP. And we've got FirstNet, which is an IP network. So theoretically, over time, all of these will be a common IP backend. Land mobile radio is the only service that provides off-network push-to-talk. And ProSe, as I said, is meant to be off-network FirstNet, but I think it's dead on arrival. Um, any network can fail during emergencies, no matter how hardened it is. Having both LMR and FirstNet helps, but there have been and will still be failures. Hurricanes, wildland fires, um, you've got power companies that shut power off over there in California. We're lucky we don't have that yet, but I'm hoping our power companies don't get that idea. Um, so public safety does not and cannot provide communications for shelters and other emergency response locations. Ham radio operators typically have provided these services. FirstNet, by the way, has eight points of possible failure from the antenna, site power, backhaul, and onto the network core. Land mobile radio has graceful degradation, capabilities FirstNet does not have. Um, but the two networks work in concert with each other. FirstNet does provide cows, colts, and flying drones, as I have said. But if you order a cow in Santa Barbara today, it's going to be six to eight to 12 hours before you see that cow show up. Because um, there are 78 of them all over the country. And yes, they're spread out. Um, so they have to drive a distance to get to you. Um, land mobile si radio systems also uh, suffer outages. The bottom line is there is no such thing in communications as five nines of reliability during disasters. It's not going to happen. So ham radio has always been there when needed, and you need to, we need to continue to be prepared and bring our own network. That's an important point. The other networks are up and operating. When they fail, people have to go fix them. When the hams show up, you bring your own networks with you. So you have a decided advantage. Um, incident command is a big deal. It's bigger now because before an incident commander for police or fire had just to deal with the police or the fire, but now at FirstNet, 
they're all sharing the same bandwidth. So they have to do unified incident command so that everybody knows. Uh, one of my uh, exercises was to set up a hostage situation in a building, single cell sector, everybody's there, police, fire, EMS, um, somebody is injured in the building, they're brought outside the EMS, the EMS is told by the hospital to start a, um, a scan of the body, which can be done over LTE, but it takes six megabits of, of data. And if everybody else is using data and there's no coordination, there's going to be a problem. So we have to be very, very careful. And by the way, I think that a lot of hams should take the free forma, FEMA classes uh, on incident command and structure and can help public safety as they learn how to deal with all of this because they're going to have to learn. You have mesh networks and before I, I left Santa Barbara before you had your mesh networks put in, so I'm not going to talk much about them because I'm a novice when it comes to, to mesh networks, but I have a lot of respect for the people that are working on them and putting them up. So public safety has both land mobile radio and broadband networks. The networks are in fixed locations. HAM have repeaters, mesh networks, and much more, all capable of mobile operations. The HAM advantage is they take themselves, their equipment, and their networks to where they're needed. So I think there is still a spot, even with all of what's going on in public safety, for HAM radio operators to play an important part. And I'll take questions if there are any. How do we do this? Levi, are you, everybody's muted, right? Yeah, so let's see, uh, let's turn it over to Bill. It looks like he has a comment and then I'll try okay. to figure out. Okay, I thought I heard a break in there. Um, <clears throat> Andy, I have a question. Santa Barbara has a lot of back country in the San Rafael and we keep getting called back there. You know, search and rescue has a pretty good mandate uh, in the back country and I've done fire patrols and many other things going on back there, including our airborne repeater, which was successful in uh, <clears throat> finding the lost hiker a year ago. Uh, if we, Santa Barbara bills out, I think you and I spoke that it would require 30 some odd additional uh, fixed sites uh, in the county, how does that play out in the future of uh, <clears throat> future of all of this and, and infrastructure and so forth? Uh, are we prepared for that? Well, Bill, since I left, there's been a lot of changes, but my understanding is that the um, county is going to take the sheriff's UHF frequencies and use those in the rural areas of this county and add 700 megahertz trunk radios for city and more urban areas. So the 36, 38 uh, systems we, you and I were talking about was all at 700 megahertz. What they've done is they've said, we can cover a bunch of the county with UHF or VHF, and then we'll cover like the city of Santa Barbara and other places with trunk radio. Now, as far as FirstNet is concerned, FirstNet has been building out cell coverage. Um, I hear all the time um, that um, uh, Verizon has better coverage. And I know when I was living in Santa Barbara, Verizon had better coverage than AT&T. There's no doubt in my mind. But I will bet today that if you took my vehicle, which measures both FirstNet and Verizon, and you drove it all over the county, you would come back and find that FirstNet now has better coverage than Verizon does. Is this going to require any build out of infrastructure for the future? Well, it probably will. What, what uh, we've been trying to do in other areas, in, in southern Arizona, for example, what we've done is we've worked a deal where uh, when public safety has an antenna, they share the space with FirstNet 
or if FirstNet has an antenna, they share the space with public safety to try to build a network that is converged uh, and in coverage. I have one last question. The uh, site downtown, we are co-located with uh, AT&T, which has been taken over, of course, by uh, uh, Crown Castle and so forth, which is within 25 to 50 feet of all the land mobile radio transmitters for the city and some county radios, including a lot of stuff that we have there in amateur radio. And I think um, I think there was a comment by you at one time, uh, there's gonna be hell to raise, I guess, if 5G comes up on there. What was that related to, and do you still, still see a problem? Well, there, there's two issues. First is that in some areas of the country, Miami being one, Okay, so um, that's a concern. It can be fixed with filters, but it has to be addressed. And I'm sure that in the bidding process, it's being addressed. We don't know what the effects of 5G will be, uh, especially at that location, because that location is not a very good location for millimeter wave 5G. So it will probably be mid-band, 2.5 to, to 3 or 4 uh, gigahertz. So I don't know that that's going to create a problem, but I do know that whoever is putting stuff on that hill better make damn sure that they do some propagation and, and interference studies. Question. Okay. Uh, this is Mike W0JFB. I have a question. Uh, I, not a question, actually. I just want to thank you for bringing up um, the importance of getting uh, ICS command structure training. I've certified myself uh, ICS 100, 200, 300, and NIMS 700 uh, 20 years ago you know, when I was working for Crest React in Riverside. Our AM group in Riverside was involved with the community law enforcement fire department. And when there was a fire or major disaster or something like that, uh, we had hams that were certified to actually have one assigned to the command uh, center and then the rest of the hams would be posted someplace according to the hams, according to the ham uh, command center instructions by law enforcement to be eyes and ears. Um, it's very, it's been one of my pet peeves since I'm a retired peace officer it was one of my pet peeves to make sure um, we cannot do that. But I, I find myself a little bit concerned with the local authorities here being receptive to hams being involved in the command center. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, when I was there, it hadn't changed. I mean, um, some areas I've lived in, like Phoenix, I'll give you an example. Um, there are hundreds of repeaters on VHF and UHF everywhere. There are 40 amateur radio clubs. It's hard to know which one to join. But when you look at the repeater list, one thing pops out, which is the city of Phoenix EOC has five repeater set setups. Um, they've got remote repeaters. They've got uh, uh, amateur radio in some of the dispatch centers. And they're very, very active here. But it took them a lot of years to do it. The, the real hard part is uh, making sure, and this is my opinion, but making sure that public safety <coughs> does not think that ham radio operators are coming there to do anything except communicate. That's the most important point that they need to understand. When you go to help the sheriff or the fire or city or whoever, you're a communicator. You move traffic from A to B. You don't operate any differently than that. You don't make any changes to it. You don't do anything except get the point A to point B. Let's try something uh, different. I know there are people who have questions and, and um, it's kind of hard to 
raise your hand or if you don't have video, you may not be able to raise your hand. If you click on the button that says participants in this window, you'll get a list of everybody in here and you'll also get some buttons that say yes, no, go slower, go faster. Um, if you don't mind, if you've got a question, <coughs> Andy, if you'll click the yes button, we'll see a, a light come up next to your name and we'll call on you. It'll be a little bit like Congress. Uh, I see a question from Callie and from Eric. So let's start with Callie first. And you've got to unmute yourself, Callie. Yeah, um, I don't know if I'm getting in here or not. Yep, uh, I hear you. Uh, Andy, I just the, the little Leos, to go back there, there's also some sort of, uh, going back to that wedding cake, where, what sort of, what sort of performance were they actually thinking those little Leos were going to provide relative to that? It depends on who you talk to. If you talk to Eldon Musk, um, they're going to be 5G little Leos covering the world. There's going to be plenty of signal. It's going to be low latency. The handoffs are going to be smooth. Everything's going to work differently and great. If you talk to some of the other people in the satellite business, their answer is, until we get this turned on, we're not quite sure. <laughs> That's right. lovely. I like that. Thank you. Uh, Eric and then uh, Brian. Eric, WXC. And you're muted. <coughs> oh, he's still muted. So let's go to Brian and uh, I think he's having an issue, so. Okay, you hear me okay? Yep, we hear you, Brian. Okay, I have uh, two questions. First one from a uh, YouTube viewer, and that is, um, what do you think, how do you, uh, well, the FCC has been talking about taking the three gig allotment away from amateur radio. Um, what do you see happening there? Right. That so, happen? so let me give you an, answer, an honest answer. And this is not meant to be political, but it's going to have to be political. This particular FCC doesn't give a damn about critical communications or ham radio. What they care about is John Q business and what John Q business wants. We never should have had Wi-Fi 6 plop down where all the critical communications microwave is. We never should have had Legato put a, get permission to put a system right next to GPS. They don't use engineering anymore in the FCC. They use their gut and what the business community wants. Now, the good news is that no matter who wins in November, there will probably be a new FCC chairman and maybe we'll get somebody who gives a damn. Okay, <clears throat> question number two. Um, I hear, I've heard from many people, uh, non-hams, non-radio people, especially in the Montecito area, they are all up in arms about, uh, somebody's got them convinced that 5G is gonna turn their brains into cottage cheese. And they've even started a group, they've had PhDs come and speak to them and and uh, they, they're uh, you know how when you lived here you know how the Montecito people were they were the first to complain about their calls dropping and the first to complain about new cell sites going in. so um, what do you what do you say to people like that that are convinced that their fingernails are going to fall off and everything else you know, there's not a whole lot you can say to people like that they're wrong and everybody knows that. If you kept track of what's going on in the UK and in Canada, people are actually setting some of the cell sites on fire because they're concerned about 5G. Um, there are some people who say that 5G brought the virus with it. And um, there's no way in the world, and, and by the way, um, you, anybody who has the feeling that this is going to hurt them, you can't reason with them, first of all. Because you can tell them that, you know, you got Wi-Fi in your house, which has more radiated power locally 
than 5G does. You've got an electric meter uh, probably on the wall outside of your bedroom that has radio in it. Um, you want to use cell, you're surrounded. And um, people are going to have to just use it. I mean, one of the experiences I had in Montecito, there is a gentleman there who was in NYPD Blue, you might remember. He lives in Montecito. I went and gave a speech in Montecito. And afterwards, he came up to me and he said, okay, what do cell sites have to do with coverage? That's where I had to start. Um, when I was in Santa, um, in Santa Cruz, I went to a hearing where county commissioners wanted to require all cell sites antennas to be 10 feet underground. Um, so the, the level of education is not here. And again, you know, if you're a Democrat and you're trying to argue with a Republican, forget it. The other way around too. So if you're if you're a believer in radio and you run into somebody who's not, um, it's really hard to get them to understand the difference um, or to understand that it's not going to do the damage that everybody claims it will. And my experience, by the way, I have I have an expression for that, which is paper doesn't refuse ink. <laughs> Oh, thank crisis, you. crisis manager. I think um, Very good. I got a question. Okay. Yeah, there he is. Uh, yeah, I finally got back in here and I don't know what happened. Got <laughs> muted. Uh, Eric, KG6 WXC here. Did the great talk there, Andrew. It's, uh, it's been wonderful. Um, I have lots of questions, but I'm going to try to just maybe put it down to just one or two okay. here. Um, one with the uh, first net. Um, where does the Arden mesh fit into that? Can it? Well, it it, it doesn't really fit into it. Um, but the point is um, that first net is not going to cover everywhere in the world. And first net, um, if you look during hurricanes and fires and everything else, um, first net has gone down. There have been cows coming in to help them, but it's still a network that is in place and fixed, and they're not going to be able during an emergency to handle traffic to and from hospitals and that kind of thing that I understand that you do with mesh. Yeah, you're probably right about that. Not quite yet, um, but hopefully we'll get it going. I'm one of the helpers of development of it, so we can probably yeah it's we're we're getting to that point we're pushing it as basically as about as far as we can so far well and one of the things that you ought to do once you've got it set up is to get some people from the agencies who are involved in communications and invite them to go see a demonstration at both ends yeah we we've we've done that so uh, I'm sure you've heard about the uh, the cow that was out on the uh, the Barstow to Vegas race that was providing links for the their mesh network that they put out there. Right. Um, uh, my last question then is: so, what do you think is going to happen to uh, the three gigahertz ham allocations and the five gigahertz ham allocations? I I don't know. I wish I did, but with FCC today, there is no way to judge what they're going to do. If you look, I mean, they already took the 2.5. They're looking everywhere they can. One of the things that we didn't talk about is public safety has 4, 50 megahertz of spectrum at 4.9. And the FCC is saying it's underused, so we want to take it away or mix somebody else with it. Well, the reason it appears to be underused is you file licenses for a geographic area instead of the number of base stations and the number of mobiles. So you can't tell how much is used. Um, 5.9, which is where all the automobile stuff is working, 
They now, the FCC, says, oh, that's underutilized too. So we want to put Wi-Fi 6 up there too. So I wish I had an answer for you, but I'm hoping that none of this three or five gigahertz stuff comes up until we have a new FCC. <laughs> I agree. Thank you for that. So, okay, I'm done. Bruce, did you oh, have I'm a question? Leaving. Uh, yes, uh, the light band is used by a lot of cell phone service, and how is this going to affect the various uh, cell phone companies that use the light band for the, you know their cell cell phones that they have everybody out there connected to? Well, um, okay, FirstNet is just like a cellular carrier; they're using. I mean, look at Verizon, for example, on 700 megahertz, Verizon has 20 megahertz of spectrum. Um, FirstNet has 20 megahertz of spectrum, but um, all of the carriers also have spectrum at 800, at 700, at 1.2, and some Sprint 2.5. So their spectrum, while it's wideband, is spread out all over the spectrum. And your cell phone is an amazing device. If you look at it, it probably has 30 different frequency bands and somewhere in the neighborhood of 17 antennas built into it. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, the Montecito question, I think, could be solved by uh, these people could just wear their tinfoil hats. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the last thing that happened in Montecito when I was there is they got some distributed antenna systems put along the rights away yeah. and um, for Verizon. And what happened there was the residents complained about the battery packs at the bottom of the telephone uh. cars. So the battery packs got removed. So what you have is a Verizon small cell network in Montecito, where if the power fails, the network's down. Well, they removed the battery packs, and now if AC power goes down, that they lose their cell service. I hope everybody will be happy. Yeah, well, I right. tried to explain that, but they didn't want to hear it. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I enjoyed the presentation. Thanks very much. You're quite welcome. Rod has his hand up. And so does Brian. So let's go to Rod first. All right, thank you. Um, and uh, welcome from Mesa, Arizona. It's good to see Andy out there and uh, all these other familiar faces. Uh, I have a hardware question. And um, a lot of times uh, ham radio benefits from spin-offs from commercial radios. And I know the frequencies are not the same, but uh, is it remotely possible that some of the radio Radios that are used for first net may be uh, somehow tweaked to advantage to be used by ham uh, radio. But Rod, the, the real question is, you know, these are, these are LTE digital radios, um, and most of ham radio stuff is still land mobile radio analog or, or DMR, um, so they're not compatible at all. Now, let me give you a, a little different here. Um, okay, so this is my latest toy. This is made by Harris Corporation, and it is four bands, VHF, UHF, 700, 800, plus it is FirstNet. So it has all of that built into one, one device. Now, that's a nice device, but it's $7,500. Oh, but then there's China. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting things from China. And if we have our IWCE show in Las Vegas in August now, as it was postponed from March, there will be a lot of the Chinese vendors there. They don't have it quite right, but they're learning quickly. Okay, yeah, ham, ham operators are pretty good at uh, kind of converting things to make them work in the ham band. And this right here, my cell phone, it's my favorite ham radio exciter. I use more than I use any other ham radio, and I just interface it to devices that uh, operate on the ham band, uh, specifically mesh networking. But uh, 
it can be interfaced to other things too. So, um, I, you know, I'm kind of going to keep an eye on things and see if there's anything I, I out there. Say, I might be able never to say never because there's a lot of technology coming out. Um, All right. Thank you. It's great seeing you on the air here. Nice seeing you too. We don't live too far from each other, you know. No. <laughs> yeah, when we get a chance, we should, uh, you know, drop Yeah, when we're allowed to, yes. <laughs> okay, let's see. I've got uh, Brian and then uh, Eric. You got to unmute, Brian. I think you got muted. Maybe I muted you. Yeah, let me see. There you go. All right. Thanks, Levi, and thank you, Mr. Seibel. That was a great presentation. My question is about, um, are there privacy benefits to using a dumb phone as opposed to a smartphone as 5G goes live? Or is, the, uh, is, is 5G a data network interfacing with old school dumb phone flip phones the same as it would with a smartphone? Uh, okay, first of all, you're talking about cybersecurity. So let's look, LTE has two levels of encryption built into it, but people can still get to it. Um, my um, iPhone, which is on FirstNet, um, looks like a regular iPhone, but when because it says it's FirstNet, I have an extra three levels of encryption built into it um, because that network has to meet all of the federal guidelines for um, getting data from uh, wants and warrants and things like that. So the network has to be super secure. 5G is an interesting uh, thing because cybersecurity should have been baked in from the day one. And now we're going to try to add it over top. And there are some people, and I'm not an expert on 5G, I'll tell you that. But there are some people who are very, very concerned about how secure it's going to be. And there are some people say that it's going to be buttoned down very tightly. So I don't know. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, Eric, did I mute you or are you able to go? I'll try to unmute. Let's see. There you go. You're live. There you go. You got me unmuted. So, Andrew, again, thank you for all this. It's really great info. But um, when I was asking you about the Arden Mesh Network, Mesh Network before, is there a way that it could play a role in like a last ditch, last mile effort in order to get stuff going and be compatible with the first net? stuff at all you know, that's that's a really interesting question and the answer is twofold the answer is yes it's possible it can be done and the second answer is no it's not legal to do it well in an emergency legalities um or smegalities but yes okay um you know if you don't ask permission then you just say oh i'm sorry if you ask permission, you're going to get told no. The, the, diff, the problem is that FirstNet is a Part 90 public safety license, and your mesh network is amateur radio licensed. And um, the FCC would cringe uh, at trying to put those two networks together. Yeah, I can imagine. But I was thinking in a pinch. So, But thank you, though. Yep. For everything, but I, you know, you can do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? I know some people have found the raise hand button. I'm looking for both the yes, uh, green lights, and the uh, the raised hands. JFB, I think, has a question. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah it, Andrew, this is Mike J, J, W zero JFB. Um, I am using currently Verizon. And I, when I retired, the department, I don't know if I'm part of the net or what, but I never have any problems getting through to uh, local authorities at all on my cell phone, no matter where I'm at. Well, you probably won't. Um, in normal conditions, 
there's plenty of bandwidth available. What happens is, let me give you an example. If you were at a baseball game and the stadium had not been wired for in-building uh, communications, you would probably have a lot of problems getting out. Um, as would somebody on AT&T and T-Mobile and Sprint. The, the secret is how many people are in a single cell sector at any one time using data. And that number is dependent on how much that network can give before it collapses. So in an emergency, the, the problem, let me go back to the problem with the Oklahoma bombing. Nobody could talk fire, police, feds, state, none of them could talk LMR. So they went to use their cell phones and nobody could get through on the cell phone. They finally went to the broadcast stations and asked them to make an announcement to get people in the immediate area off of their cell phones so the public safety could use it. And that didn't work, by the way. So that is the time that things are hardest is when you're in a very small area with a lot of people all using phones and you run out of bandwidth in a given um, cell site. It doesn't happen very often, but it does. Um, now the other, I mean, one, I'm just going to digress for a minute if I may. When we were trying to get this bill through Congress, we had a bunch of people in the House and the Senate who didn't want to vote for it. What happened was there was an earthquake in Northern Virginia the day before the vote and nobody in Washington, D.C. could use their phones. All of the cell networks were up, but they were all jam-packed. Our vote went the next day and we got the award. Very simple lesson for them. Thank you. Rod, do you have another question? He's muted. Muted. Sometimes people get muted by me and they can't get unmuted. So let me see if I can unmute him. Uh, there we go. I unmuted and you muted me. <laughs> Sorry. There's a little <laughs> lag. Okay. So um, I have a question about 911. Okay. Um, I realize that as long as 911 works and phones work to get to 911, there may not be very much need for ham radio communication. It's, a, it's our first point of contact and it does a pretty darn good job up to a point. My question is kind of twofold. Um, rhetorically, who are you gonna call if 911 fails? And I'm sure there will be a lot of people that say 911 will never no, fail. I'd like to get uh, your comment on that, but I'm also interested in the enhancement that FirstNet offers to 911. And um, can you comment on how that might beef up 911 um, and make it uh, more reliable? Okay. Well, first of all, 911 crashes all the time in various <laughs> places of the country. And we had a case in Arizona where somebody deliberately cut a fiber string from southern to northern uh, Arizona and took out all the 911 in upstate Arizona. We had a case in New York where the busiest 911 center in the world went down because Verizon did an update to a software package that ran their switch. So there are lots of failures. Today, the need is different. Today, there are a lot of 911 centers that are operating with dispatchers at home um, through the internet and everything else. Virginia is a very good case in point. They have half their staff in and the other half of the staff have portable phones and portable computers and they're operating from home. Um, 911 FirstNet um, does not carry 911 traffic in reality. So it's not going to be that helpful. However, I will say as a caveat, in Kentucky, uh -huh. since their 911 center was remoted, um, they are using FirstNet phones to get 
the 911 calls in and out of the center. So it's there, but there is still a need for, um, there are times when um, 911 is down. And I was in the earthquake in Loma Prieta and there was no 911 service. There was no anything. And what we did was we put a ham at every payphone, and now there aren't any payphones, but every payphone in Santa Cruz County. And we told people on the air that if they had an emergency, the broadcast stations did, to go to their nearest payphone and talk to the ham radio operator. That's great. Are, are there other things that work well when 911 is down? Um, <laughs> no. If you're, trying, if you're trying to get a hold of 911 and 911 landlines are down, generally they don't. They have business lines in there, but even if they have a 411 system, it's it's handled somewhere else. Thanks. It sounds like we need to cover that. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like CHP monitoring the, the CB traffic, and they don't don't tell you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Ken. K-E-N. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ken? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, did you have a question? I do. Thanks, Andy, for the presentation. It's good seeing you again for a couple of years. Um, two questions. Um, and I missed the very beginning, so you may have already done this, but I'm wondering if you have a FirstNet telephone. You could, I saw the one that was the, what, quad band, but I'm wondering if you have one that's strictly FirstNet or if it just looks like a regular old cell phone. And second, any thoughts on uh, G5 and, sorry, 5G and rain fade? I know that's supposed to be a pretty big problem, so I was wondering if you had, if that's come up for you. Yeah, no, well, the, um, so 5G low, uh, low band, which, you know, the terminology is crazy. Low band for 5G is 600 megahertz. Um, low band for me is 30 megahertz. But anyhow, um, at, 600, at 600 megahertz, it acts like LTE, so there won't be much problem. Where there's going to be a problem is up in the millimeter band, wave bands, 24 gigahertz, 32 gigahertz, 37 gigahertz, and I'm not sure, I'm sure that people have done the studies, but I have not seen any reports. Uh, Verizon has some of it deployed in Phoenix, but it never rains here, um, unless we have a monsoon. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. I certainly know some people I can ask, and I will. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, let's see, does Callie have another question? Callie. He's muted. He's muted. Let's see, Callie. Thank you. So I had a comment that I, we, we did try, the city tried uh, 70 gigahertz uh, link from uh, La Vigia over to the engineering one at UCSB. And that was an interesting experience. Uh, just the fog every day was, uh, was an interesting mess. Yeah. I mean, that's seven miles, but uh, and about a one foot dish, I think it was. Well, that, that's one of the reasons why they say at millimeter wave, and I said it in my presentation, they uh, measure the coverage in, in yards, not in miles. Um, what they're saying basically is that if you have a block of houses in a residential area, you'll probably have at least two, if not three, um, millimeter wave uh, microcells in that area. Did, did you mention anything about the uh, the oxygen absorption at 60 gig? No, I didn't. Yeah, that, that's also a factor, but anyways. Okay, let's see if there's any, I don't see any other hands up in the list. Uh, are there any other questions? Wave or flail or scream, unmute? Let us know, otherwise I'm gonna turn it back over to Ryan. Almost nine o'clock. Okay, right on time here. <clears throat> Thank you, Andy. That was really informative. Um, 
that uh, matter of fact, that's one of the better presentations we've had since since I've been around. So uh, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to uh, spend with us, and and uh, uh, I, I'm very envious of all your radios and super cell phones. And um, anyway, thank you very much. You're, you're quite welcome. And by the way, if anybody wants a copy of the presentation. I know it's been recorded, but Mr. UUQ has a PDF file of my presentation. Oh, great. Thank you. You still around, Bill? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, well, we're just about on time like we would be for a normal meeting. So uh, anybody, any of the members, anyone else have any uh, anything, any business for the club? We got some questions about uh, whether the um, presentation will be available online, and it will. I'm going to upload it to the club website just like I did last month. So, uh, and I believe Andy, you, you wanted to provide also the slides as a downloadable PDF for uh, uh, Bill has Bill has that file. I have, um, yeah. Okay. And if, if you'll just send me an email, I'll answer directly with uh, the same PDF that you saw tonight. Great. I, I should can, say PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Okay. I can post yeah. that alongside too on the website. Thank you all. It's I, I, I really miss Santa Barbara, but it's sure nice seeing all of you again. Well, you know, I, we're going to be having meetings online for the foreseeable future. So, you know, feel free to join us anytime. We won't we won't uh, ask you to put on a presentation, but if you're just uh, sitting around doing nothing, you know. I may take you up on that. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Thanks again, Andy. All right, everybody. Thank you for uh, participating tonight. We had, I think, at the we had like 51 or 52 people, I think, at the high point. So that's pretty good. And uh, even uh, we got Daryl even checked in here, but he didn't. I guess he doesn't have a camera on his. Uh, uh, computer, but if you're still listening, Daryl, uh, hey Daryl, how you doing? And we miss you. And uh, anyway, all right. Well, I guess we're adjourned. Everybody can go on about their business and uh, have a great weekend. Hey Brian, this actually works out better than going to the school. <laughs> yeah, you know, a couple people have said that that they kind of like this because everybody can. We get people that don't usually come to the meetings, and uh, they're able to they're able to uh, log in. Actually, one of the things I'm going to be doing, even when we can have meetings again, because I know there's a lot of camaraderie and you know uh, stuff that goes on before and after the meetings, and that's always fun to do. But I think we're going to look into how we can keep doing this with the you know from the meeting, you know, uh, uh, get so people can attend the meeting. It wouldn't be that hard, really. We just take and point the camera out to the room or to the presentation or whatever, and and uh, you could even project the, the what we're looking at here on our screens on the big screen. And um, uh, you know, we'll we'll figure out something. We got I got a couple computers that we could use for that, but uh, uh, that way, you know, people that live in Ventura and Oxnard and Channel Islands and Port Wyneme, if they want to check in, or even Andy from Arizona or Rod from Arizona, uh, we can get everybody in on the meeting. We can record the meetings and, and uh, keep, them, uh, uh, keep them for posterity. Hey, Brian, so, I have a question real quick, if you don't mind. Sure. I'm studying for my uh, general and soon I'll be studying for my extra class license. And uh, I want to know if it's, I want to, I want to time my uh, awareness of the exam questions so that I can take them at a time when I can realistically take the exam. I don't want to like get, uh, I don't want to be getting high scores on my practice tests only to find that it's going to be two months or three more months before I can actually take the test in person. So my question is, is there a realistic way in the foreseeable future that I could take an exam? I wish I could answer that for you, but right now I can't. The you know we're uh, just a couple of weeks ago the FCC sort of gave us guidance that if we could work out some way to do a remote exam that we could do it. 
Um, they're kind of leaving it uh, up to the, you know, up to the VEs. So we've, uh, 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 Tom didn't check in here tonight, but we talked about it at the board meeting. And, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of people that want to take tests. So um, we get them every week. We get three or four people inquiring every week. So, uh, you know, we're going to try and figure something out that doesn't, that isn't going to require uh, physical presence so that we can do it remotely. And uh, the, the big thing is, is that we got to monitor the examinee. So, or not me, but the VE, there has to be a VE somehow monitoring the examinee to make sure you're not using prohibited devices or looking at reference material or something like that. So, um, we'll figure that out. And uh, I believe that there's another uh, VE group that, um, uh, is working on some kind of online test. So generate a test and you can take it actually on your computer. So that'd be kind of cool. It's uh, this sort of caught everybody by surprise, obviously. And it's, it, it really highlighted the need to progress a little bit into the future and, and uh, think about alternatives to the traditional, you know, group licensing <laughs> session. Cool. But yeah, keep checking back and uh check into net and you know during the week or something and ask again or you know if, if some if we're when we come up with something we'll post it immediately on the website okay no rush i'm just starting out on my uh general material so but i appreciate that thank you okay sure rod has a comment i think oh rod go ahead rod oh he's muted uh let's see i'm gonna unmute him hopefully he doesn't yeah there we go keep unmuting and muting each other <laughs> there we there go, we, go. <laughs> we were playing tag again um i have heard uh or read on the internet so it must be true that uh there are there's at least one club that has conducted tests online um and they were legitimate as far as the fcc went and it even sounded like they were allowing people from outside their territory to conduct tests that way somehow. So I don't know the details, but there seems like there may be um, uh, an outlet right now, even before Santa Barbara sets something up. And uh, I, I think if it was me, I'd contact the ARRL or just to uh, uh, do some browsing on the internet to see if you can find the clubs that are doing that and contact them to see what they have to say. Um, Actually, so, uh, yeah, on the, you know, the, the ARRL uh, RSS feed or their news uh, that they, if, you, if you're an ARRL mem member, you get a weekly like summary of all the, all the latest news or daily or whatever it is. And there was an article about that um, uh, last week or the week before. And uh, so if you go to the website, go to the news section, and scroll those, there's there's one or two articles, in fact. And I think that's, uh, uh, there was one about a, a group in Alaska uh, that's, that's uh, doing remote testing to uh, regions in Alaska. And then there was another one, I can't remember where it was. It seemed to me it's like Texas or something like that, somewhere in the south, southern part of the state, so or, or country. Uh, that's what I was gonna say, it was Alaska. Yeah, I think they were doing it, and then yeah, there was another group that was setting up to do it on a large scale too. And heard something they did like 60, 60 participants, and they all passed like the last time they did it. So it's, that's suspicious. there's other things coming <laughs> around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody passes. Everybody passes. Well, no, yeah, I know. I was trying to. I, yeah, I have to admit, I was like, well, how can I get my six-year-old to pass? <laughs> They'd be sitting there just out of camera range. You can get your dog a license. Kind of being like, look. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, stand out of camera range and be like, look, three, two, two, two. Okay, was there another question? That was me. Oh, okay. That was, that was you, yeah. You said, it, you said what I wanted. Yeah. I kept, you know, I don't have a hand button on mine. No, I don't have one either. That's why I didn't know that I could tell people to use it because I think the hosts don't see the, the hand button. So, 
Uh, you know, I see him in the column here. Yeah, I see him in the column. I just can't raise my hand. So yeah, I can't raise mine either. I guess and, and, good you guys are the hosts. So, yeah. So. Oh, okay. Oh, probably, that makes yeah. sense. Well, it's we good to know I can. Quiet when we're raising our hands. Yeah. It's good well, to know we can leave use it to that. the Chinese to think of all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Well, once I get done sending a copy to China, I'll post it on the website. Yes. Well, your bandwidth <laughs> should be fine, so you'll be okay. It's probably already done. They're watching this in Wuhan right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think the Alaskan uh, place. I think it's. K, I think their call is KL7AA for for Brian. It sounds right. I think saying from what I said, from what I read. I think Saw. he bailed out. Can write it down though, or so that we can. KL seven uh, alpha alpha. Yeah, he got it. He's he's uh he's just muted, but he said he got it. All right. Anybody have anything else? Okay, guys. Well, stay healthy. Take care. All right. Have a good weekend. Thank uh, you very much, Levi, for, for being the producer here. Yeah, it's kind of fun. It's like r running a live TV show with 30 cameras and 30 mics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm Everybody's out. staring right at you, too. You guys have a good weekend. <laughs> kind of weird. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you guys have a good one. Thank okay. you. This is cool. I didn't have to drive all the way up there. So. <laughs> Good to yeah. see you, Bill, and Levi, and everybody else. Good to see hey, you again. All you guys. Yeah. Even Rod. Yeah, and Bill yeah. even comes. Him. He never comes to meetings. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. I didn't oh, know yeah, I'm here. Bill in here. So. Yeah. It's awesome. The only way you, you can have a meeting have a good drink one. at the same time, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's really cool. I think you can sit here and eat food and drink beer and do whatever. Yeah. Okay, there goes the phone. Great. You guys have a good night. All right. Talk to you.